Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for braving the, continuing the endless summer to be with us today for History's Lunch here in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, it's on. Let's see if it's knock, knock. Yes, no, maybe. Eric, microphone, Sam. I promise it worked earlier. Is it working now? Hey, even better. A few notes before we get started with today's program. The Austin Film Series in the Welty Garden will kick off this Friday evening for the third year. Um, it's a lot of fun. You bring a blanket or a chair, spread it out on the front yard at the Welty House, and we show you a Jane Austen film, Persuasion is uh, the first one. It will start at 6.45, it's free of charge, and join us for that this Friday. And then the Manship House Museum will offer an evening of Victorian era board games on Thursday, September 27th at 5 p.m. It's free for ages seven and up. Call or email to reserve a spot, and uh, you can find that. I, I had put out a few fans, but I think they're gone with the information on it, but you can get with me afterwards and I'll, I'll get you the contact information. Or you can email info at manshiphouse.com, which is pretty straightforward. And then I hope that you'll be able to join us back here next week when our History's Lunch speakers will be Lucy Allen, Jimbo Harwell, and David Morris discussing the architecture of this building. We had two great programs last year by each of the exhibit design firms for the Civil Rights Museum and the History Museum. And this was a program that we wanted to have, but we couldn't make it happen last year where we have the architects discussing the unique architecture for these buildings um, and the history of that project. Uh, it's going to be really great. Look forward to that. Today, we are delighted to have Dr. Rick DeShazer with us to talk about the new University Press of Mississippi book he edited, The Racial Divide in American Medicine, Black Physicians, and the Struggle for Justice in Healthcare. Dr. DeShazer earned his MD degree at the University of Alabama School of Medicine in 1998 following stints at the Tulane University School of Medicine and the University of South Alabama Department of Medicine, Dr. DeShazo came to the University of Mississippi Medical Center as chair of the Department of Medicine. He was designated a Billy S. Guyton Distinguished Professor in 2002. Dr. DeShazo hosted the live weekly medical call-in program Southern Remedy on Mississippi Public Broadcasting Radio and has produced a series of award-winning documentary programs on obesity for MPB television. Currently, Dr. DeShazo is adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Alabama School of Medicine in Birmingham. Help me welcome Dr. Rick DeShazo.
How's that? Is that better? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, my mother, uh, who was, uh, I could write another book about her, uh, she hired uh, Miss Mary Alice Rice to keep me out of trouble because both she and my uh, dad worked. Now Mary, Mary washed clothes, fixed meals, kept up with me, and read me the Bible every day while she was feeding her two children for $15 a week. That was the going uh, wage for domestic help in Birmingham at the time. She also cooked the best soul food that I've ever tasted, including a unique combination of salt and fat back, hot peppers and turnip greens, that was very effective in elevating both your cholesterol and your blood pressure simultaneously. I loved her dearly and think about her daily. Like most Americans, Miss Mary had rotten teeth. Uh, most Alabamians, Miss Mary was impoverished and had rotten teeth and uncontrolled blood pressure. Unlike our family, she never saw a doctor or a dentist. I remember weekends when my mother secretly took her to her operatory, which she called her office, for good reason. It was there that she became transfixed into a dentist and pulled Mary's teeth in my presence one by one. Subsequently, when Miss Mary smiled, all you could see were her gums. It's hard to gum turnip greens and fat back, so mom fixed that too. A patient in the dental office died before she could pick up her dentures, so mom refitted them for Miss Mary, and they worked just fine. Mom also learned how to take blood pressure and got a nurse friend from the office next door to bootleg her blood pressure medicine so she could treat Mary's high blood pressure. These gyrations made me a little crazy. I really couldn't figure this out. Uh, but at that time in Birmingham, white dentists and doctors didn't see black patients, and there were very few blacks, black physicians to take care of them. I asked my mother, why was this the case? How is it that Miss Mary read the Bible to me every day and you took me to Sunday school and this just didn't fit? Her answer was, that's just how it is. Then I asked Miss Mary the following Monday the same question and she said, you'll figure it out. I've spent the rest of my life and career trying to figure it out, and that's how I came to write this book. Early on, my answers led, uh, my search for answers led to this pie chart, <clears throat> which is called the social determinants of health. These are key factors in, li in the living environment that determine uh, the health of folks who live there and are remedial. Miss Mary was disadvantaged in all of these, as are so many Mississippians, Alabamians, and other residents of the old Confederacy. Our Mississippi has the worst case scenario in almost all of these, and that's why, since the data have been kept, 1990, uh, we have the worst rank in the United States on uh, overall health among the states and the shortest per capita lifespan in the United States. You would think this would be a high priority for state government and leadership, but it's not. Uh, African Americans on average live seven years shorter lives than Caucasians. I also wanted to know why our state tolerated disparities like poor access to health care and poor health outcomes and what role the larger medical community had played in addressing these issues in the past. I thought the best way to answer these questions was to better understand the history of medical practice in our state, and to my surprise, I found American medical history and Mississippi medical history are closely linked. Getting answers about Mississippi medical history, however, was a tough assignment. For instance, until this decade, college textbooks of Mississippi history had no mention of disparities in anything, 
including health, among members of its population. During the Jim Crow issue uh, era, the state's newspaper published no information or misinformation about what was going on between blacks and whites, and their suffering would have been totally sanitized had it not been for the novels of our great writers and media reports from heroes like this one, Bill Miner. I was fortunate to become acquainted with a number of individuals who are now close friends uh, who helped me with the research of this book. These include Bill, the longtime New Orleans Times Picayune Mississippi Station Chief. When Bill could not get his articles about the Civil Rights Movement <clears throat> published in the Times Picayune, he bootlegged them to the New York Times, where they were published under the authorship of staff. If you go back and look at those articles, you have a pretty clear picture of what was going on in Mississippi during that period, and those articles are now among the most authoritative records of the civil rights era. Bill also directed me to the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission's uh, somewhat sanitized files, the congressional record, and of course, the archives here. Even better, he shared uh, documented uh, documents that had not previously been published and his personal memories. Dr. Wayne Riley, the president of Meharry Medical College in Nashville at the time, gave me access to the Meharry archives, and you'll see in just a minute why that was so important. Dr. Riley and Bill Miner and former Governor Mississippi uh, Governor William Winter were co-authors of the chapters. I was also uh, fortunate uh, to uh, have uh, a number of other colleagues uh, who were members of uh, Afri uh, who were African American physicians in Mississippi during the time of the Civil Rights Movement, and not only told me their own personal stories, but directed me to uh, other uh, sources of information. Now, their stories are told uh, in Chapter Five: Black Physicians and Civil Rights Forces for and Against. This is a unique, this is a unique uh, picture uh, of uh, several of those individuals that had not been previously published. It was taken by uh, a Mississippi photographer uh, during a, um, an awards ceremony that I happened to stumble in uh, when I was uh, visiting uh, at University Press. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Aaron Shirley on the left here, who, who was forced to arm himself with shotguns after threats to his family when he served as the only black physician in Vicksburg and participated in voting rights and school desegregation activities there. He later became the first pediatric resident at UMC, participated in the first Head Start program in Mississippi, and the community health center movement with uh, someone else I'll be talking about in a second. Dr. Shirley was a MacArthur Award, a Genius Award recipient, among many other um, awards. Next to him, to the right, is the late Dr. Albert Britton. A general practitioner, like the others in this group, was only trying to improve the quality of life of his patients. That's what they were trying to do, there were no other motives. As one of the earliest civil rights activists in Mississippi, he was a member of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission Advisory Co Council <clears throat> established under the Eisenhower administration. He provided ongoing information to federal policymakers about the need for health services in Mississippi, and very few people knew what he was doing. Dr. Britton was also a personal friend of Medgar Evers, uh, and when he was gunned down in the carport of his Jackson residence, Dr. Britton quietly waited in the colored waiting room in the emergency department at UMC, where a chest surgeon who had been assisting Dr. James Hardy in one of the first heart transplants tried unsuccessfully to resuscitate 
Mr. Evers, even though doing a Herculean leak and tack. A Hercule, even though trying his very best. <laughs> um, next to Dr. Britton is Helen Barnes, who became the maternal fetal, who started the maternal fetal care program at the Delta Health Center at Mount Bayou, <clears throat> and later became the first black physician on the medical faculty at UMC. She was provided very important historical context. Uh, seated is Dr. James Anderson, uh, who, like several of the other physicians uh, mentioned, provided a medical care to civil rights workers when no one else would. Uh, during the Jackson campaign uh, and also went elsewhere to provide that information. Dr. Smith is probably wondering why he hasn't been mentioned. Uh, I think we're all uh, somewhat acquainted with Dr. Smith. I'm his cousin and uh, uh, he's here today and I appreciate him coming on the far right. This is when he was a young man. He looks the same today so you can't tell the difference. Uh, he was also present in this photo, and like all these physicians, he was a native Mississippian and precluded from attending medical school and postgraduate training in Mississippi solely because he was black. Black college graduates who uh, qualified for medical school in Mississippi were provided access to state-sponsored scholarships through the Southern uh, Governors Conference to traditionally African-American medical schools out of state. It was a carefully concocted scheme to prevent the integration of all white state educational institutions, including the University of Mississippi School of Medicine. The story of what links the southern states pursued to perpetuate segregation while assuring at the same time that many of the black physicians they sponsored would eventually choose to permanently practice out of state later is told in chapter eight of our book. Dr. Smith became known as the doctor to the civil rights movement and was one of the good doctors in this uh, award-winning book. He organized health care for mostly white college students who came to Mississippi during Freedom Summer uh, to support voting registration. He walked beside Martin Luther King in the second Memphis to Jackson march against fear in 1966. James Meredith had been shot only weeks before when he crossed the line from Tennessee into Mississippi on the first march. He was also one of the founders of the federally qualified health center movement, which had its origin in Freedom Summer. That story is told in chapter seven, Freedom Summer, Mississippi Burn burning and Jack Geiger's dream. Dr. Smith received the AMA Award of Valor in 2018, the highest award given by the American Medical Association, which was a 180 degree turnaround from his previous experience, uh, which you'll learn about in just a second. More about why he picketed the AMA during an earlier period is in that chapter. Navigation of this, uh, of this much information, uh, I found very difficult in trying to put all this together. So one of the first things that we did was fairly unique. This is not a book like it's, like it's written like a traditional historian. It's a book uh, written by a doctor. So you'll have to excuse the differences, but here's, a, here's, a, here's one example that I, I think people will uh, find uh, helpful and that is a 15-page chronology that on one side uh, lists what was going on in Mississippi, on the right side lists what was going on elsewhere in the country and how the two were connected. And this makes the point how much American history occurred as a result of what happened here and the leadership and risk-taking that so many uh, African Americans and a few Caucasians were willing to take. So we have, we can think of Mississippi history in the context of eras, and uh, those uh, eras are slavery, civil, uh, civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, the Great Society, and the present era. Prior to uh, 1900, 
Prior to 1900, medical care in Mississippi was provided by a mixture of physicians who were poorly educated as there were no licensure requirements for physicians at the time. <clears throat> One of my favorite discoveries is the story of this man, Columbus physician Gideon Linthicum. He was a successful planter and businessman in Columbus, and around 1820, a lady friend told him he would be a great doctor and promised to buy him a set of medical books and some medicines if he would become one. Well, he read the books, but found that he needed more education. So he spent a six-week internship in the woods with a Choctaw Indian medicine man and so prepared, hung up his shingles, and developed a very large and uh, quite lucrative medical practice. Now, so far as the slave era was concerned, there's a lot of discussion in the book about uh, medical care and slaves. And actually, for the most part, <clears throat> uh, slaves got better health care than poor whites during this period because they were commodities. They had a dollar value on them. And the slave owners uh, went to uh, some uh, extent to make sure that they were healthy enough to work in the fields. Planters had a book uh, that was a how-to book of slave medicine that was originally used in the West Indus, Indi, Indies and was brought to the South. It's an amazing book, uh, and I happen to have a copy of it. Uh, some planters sent the sickest to private slave hospitals like this one in Natchez, uh, run by entrepreneurs. The largest planters, like the Davis brothers from Davis Bend, uh, built their own slave uh, hospitals, and this is the Hurricane uh, Plantation of uh, Joseph Davis, Jefferson Davis's uh, brother. They had adjoining plantations below Vicksburg, uh, Briarwood, and Hurricane on the Mississippi River. The hospital that uh, Joseph Davis built was probably one of the best hospitals in the country at the time. Uh, it became a part of the Freed Freedman's Hospital Number no. Two uh, in, uh, after the Union took over Davis Bend in 1864. Um, it was uh, built before, free, uh, built after Freedman's Hospital Number no. One, the earliest uh, black hospital, all black hospital. Uh, was built uh, in Washington for contraband slaves and subsequently became the university hospital for Howard University, uh, Dr. Smith's alma mater. This model of all black hospitals became the model for segregated hospitals that was perpetuated uh, until the Civil Rights Act in 1964. That's how we got there. This model was adapted and it was actually, uh, uh, actually built on uh, during the so-called black hospital movement. During the Jim Crow period, um, blacks had no hospitals. And so what happened, because all those hospitals that were built during uh, 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 prior to Jim Crow were closed, those black hospitals. So what happened is, is that African-American fraternal organizations in the South built their own hospitals. And one of the best of these was the Taborian Hospital in Mound Bayou, built by the African-American sons and daughters. There was another one in Yazoo City that was, all, the, the one in Yazoo City was built by the African-American sons and daughters, and the one at Mound Bayou was, born, was uh, built by the uh, Knights of Tabor. So there were two organizations that built hospitals, and there were some other uh, African-American hospitals here. This one uh, at Mound Bayou was particularly good. And that connection leads to this amazing story, uh, which I was totally unaware of, of the city of Mound Bayou. And there are lots of books about that. I tried to connect the medical pieces that had not really been covered in some of the other historical material. Now, Benjamin Montgomery, 
was a slave bought at the Vicksburg um, slave market and given to Joseph Davis, the brother of Jefferson Davis, by Jefferson Davis um, as a manservant. He had come from South Carolina. He was literate, uh, and uh, he was so smart that um, he su subsequently became the business manager of Hurricane Plantation and actually was the fellow who took the profits from the plantation down to New Orleans every year to put in the bank. That's how trusted he was uh, by the Davis family. His sons, uh, also former slaves, left the plantation when it was returned to the Davis uh, family during Reconstruction and started the city of Mound Bayou, Mississippi in 1881. They literally hacked the land for Mound Bayou out of the Delta swamps and built an all-black uh, city frequently featured in the, uh, in the national press. The, the Knights of Tabor then uh, recruited uh, one of uh, the best black surgeons in the United States, Dr. T. R. M. Howard, to uh, this hospital, and he became the chief surgeon there And, and uh, when the hospital opened in 1942. This is a New York Times uh, article published uh, many years ago uh, about that uh, about the Mound Bayou story. So here, here is T. R. M. Howard sporting uh, an elegant mustache. Uh, he had a very large practice in Mound Bayou and a number of businesses. He hired and trained Medgar Evers to help him build his insurance company there. He was concerned about the way blacks were treated by whites outside the city limits of Mound Bayou and quietly started civil rights and labor organizations in the earliest days of the civil rights movement. He organized a successful gas station boycott in the Delta that held until uh, there were rest restrooms provided for black travelers. Howard held civil rights conventions in Mound Bayou that attracted nationally known politicians, uh, including Thurgood Marshall, uh, who was to become the first black justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, someone despised by Southern whites for his work with the NAACP. Now, when the Delta exploded with violence in 1954, after Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, the white citizens councils were formed in Indianola and then uh, the KKK activity uh, accelerated with that. Because of their almost universal membership in the NAACP and involvement in civil rights activities, uh, black uh, physicians uh, were very much uh, connected with what was going on in the Delta. As soon as the citizens councils were uh, formed, banks began to call in the loans of black physicians and planners who contracted with them for health care of field workers. And the number of black physicians in Mississippi dropped from a high of 71 to less than 25 during the civil rights era. The racial turmoil that was going on up there uh, uh, culminated with the <clears throat> murder of Emmett Till in 1955 and subsequently the murders of three civil rights workers prior to uh, Freedom Summer in 1964. Howard, who had just uh, experienced the unresolved murder of a close associate and the shooting of another, undertook his own investigation of the murder of Emmett Till in Money, Mississippi. He solved the crime before the FBI did and contacted the FBI and gave them the information and they still couldn't convict the murderer. Later in 1955, he was the guest speaker uh, at um, and related all the things that were going on in Mississippi to a congregation that
that included Dr. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama, and energized by his fearlessness, they launched the Montgomery bus boycott the next week. And the rest of this is history. That connection between Dr. Howard, uh, Dr. King, and the civil rights, the start of the civil rights movement being cranked up uh, has really only recently been appreciated. Shortly thereafter, Howard learned uh, that he was at the top of a KKK kill list, armed himself and his home with automatic weapons, including a Thompson machine gun, I wish I had one, uh, sold all his assets, and joined the exodus of black professionals from the state to move to Chicago. Uh, this is Emmett Till's mama here over the left. You uh, probably uh, recognize. This was at the time of the trial, um, and um, Dr. Howard was there during the trial, and 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 Miss uh, Miss Till lived uh, at his home during this period uh, when she came from Chicago. Um, so the next uh, part of this story is the Mississippi Medical and Surgical Association. Uh, how did African-American physicians come to find themselves in the middle of this mess that Howard found himself? Well, in 1869, three black professors from Howard Medical School, all of whom had served as physicians in the Union Army, applied for membership in the All-White American Medical Association, the AMA. They were turned down because they were black. Um, the decision to deny their request for membership was supported by the AMA Ethics Committee, which included an outspoken former Confederate general physician. These black physicians then formed the National Medical Association with state and local chapters like the Mississippi Medical and Surgical Association, shown here, and continued to appeal to the AMA for reconciliation and membership without success until 1968. Uh, and that's why I'm showing Robert Smith again, because uh, black Mississippi medical students, uh, graduates, who came back here on, after having those scholarships to Meharry and Howard and a few other schools, were not allowed to do their internships in Mississippi at UMC, so they had to go somewhere else, St. Louis or somewhere in the north. And when they came back here, Hospitals in the South required that physicians be members of their state medical association and, their a and the AMA as part of credentialing for hospital admissions privileges. That's the ability of a physician to be on a hospital staff and take care of people in hospitals. Since blacks were not allowed memberships in either association when they returned to Mississippi to do their three-year payback for their scholarships, they were denied membership in the state medical and the AMA and on hospital medical staff. Thus, they could neither admit their own patients for care or perform surgical procedures or deliveries, and they could not get AMA-sponsored continuing medical education. They were forced to ask white doctors to admit and care for their patients, yet another humiliation by the white medical establishment. This photo uh, on the cover of The Good Doctors shows Dr. Smith and two other physicians uh, who came to form the Medical Committee for Human Rights, uh, picketing the AMA Convention for membership by black physicians in 1963, only a few days after the murder of Medgar Evers. The new Medicare program that came in uh, in 1965, as part of the implementation of the Civil Rights Act, uh, forbade racial discrimination in medical care uh, sponsored by the federal government and, and uh, eventually forced 
hospital desegregation and the end of these uh, pernicious privileged pr hospital privileging uh, requirements for black physicians. Three years later, the AM, uh, in 1968, uh, the AMA uh, uh, forbid racial considerations in membership among its state medical associations, including the one in Mississippi. Uh, at that time, medical societies in the South, including ours, accepted black physicians for full membership for the first time. <clears throat> but most black physicians, and for good reason, felt unwelcome in AMA affiliates and remained in the National Medical Association. As recently as five years ago, medical students at UMC told me that black doctors in Mississippi had advised them to go to a more welcoming location than Mississippi to practice medicine. They are still leaving. The wounds are deep and poorly healed in Mississippi medicine, as are most black-white relationships in our state and in the South in general. So uh, the AMA did step forth in 2008. They finally got around to uh, publicly acknowledging and apologizing for the discriminatory, discriminatory actions of white physicians and admitted for the first time that that had played a role in those health disparities that I showed you at the beginning. These, these, uh, these policies and procedures that we white physicians had put in place have a lot to do with the fix uh, African Americans find themselves in today uh, medical-wise. In 2015, the, the Mississippi State Medical Association, of which I am a member and an officer, passed a resolution re supporting the sentiments of the 2008 AMA policy. So, so that many years it took us to step up to say the same thing, but at least we did it. And yes, politicians have been uh, central to this whole thing, and their, their control of medical care and medical policy is not fully appreciated. One of the most promising federal programs to come out of President Johnson's War on Poverty in 1964 was Head Start, aimed to improve the lives of children from families below the poverty line. Most black children and many white children in Mississippi qualified for being impoverished. The book tells the story of one of the first Head Start programs in the United States, Children's Development Group of Mississippi, CDGM, based in the Mississippi Delta and arising from Freedom Summer. The program started in 1965 and grew to 88 centers in 24 counties. It provided two meals, education and health care for three to five year old children. Health evaluations and referrals uh, were provided to all these children uh, through Dr. Robert Smith, who was the medical director. He convinced Aaron Shirley, James Anderson, and White Jackson pediatrician Jim Hendrick to coordinate uh, in, uh, to help with the effort among others. Now remember that name of Hendrick. I had to find one good white guy for this presentation, and he's the one I found, okay? There are a couple others, but he's, he's the one for today. Uh, in 1966, the government designated CDG, CDGM as a model Head Start program. Here's the problem. The poison pill in the federal grant for CGDM uh, really uh, struck and panicked planners and politicians, and it was uh, the promotion of educational opportunities for parents of these children. That, that included literacy, which was a big booger, uh, and secondly, voting registration. That was part of the grant, and it was approved. 
This component of the grant shook the power structure in our state to the core as it had uh, um, the potential to upset the carefully crafted plan at the end of Reconstruction to reestablish white supremacy and the good fortune of the white constituency. Governor Paul Johnson, in the middle at the bottom, I put the governors at the bottom, uh, uh, was, a, was uh, tapped the power of highly positioned and willing Mississippi congressional delegation to deep six CGDM. At Johnson's request, Governor Johnson, U.S. Representative Jamie Whidden, who was on the Agriculture Committee, uh, had the FBI visit and investigate and discredit CGDM centers, uh, and Mississippi U.S. Senators Stennis and Eastland developed a plan to cut off its funding. Eastland, sporting a foot-long illegal Cuban cigar and serving untaxed Scotch whiskey in his Senate office, regularly made racist remarks on the floor of the Senate and on television. He was the owner of one of the largest and most profitable plantations in the Delta, one highly subsidized not to grow cotton by Whitten's Agricultural Committee. By 1967, this trio, and that's Sergeant Shriver, who was the head of uh, the organiz federal organization that uh, uh, funded Head Start. Uh, this trio cut off federal funds to uh, CGDM in Mississippi, closing a program that by that time was feeding 30,000 children two meals a day and employing over 1,000 adults in their own state. This occurred at a critical time when many black sharecroppers and their families were being displaced from jobs and housing as planters mechanized. Families were living in tent cities in the Delta that resembled slave contraband camps from the Civil War era. News of all this made the, the pages of the New York Times, thanks to Bill Miner, uh, and other media uh, outlets and created a national uproar. In response uh, to Senator Eastland's claim uh, that there were no hungry children in Mississippi, uh, uh, Dr. Jim Hendricks, uh, the managing partner of the largest pediatric group in the state, who had been quietly providing health services to sick children at CDGM centers, uh, uh, got involved. After his Jackson church locked its doors to prevent blacks from worshiping there, he and a small group of religious leaders formed a new church open to all comers. He and his wife dared to provide food and personal items to freedom riders and college state students held by state police in animal pens at the state fairgrounds and at Parchman Prison during the Jackson Civil Rights Campaign. He desegregated his pediatric practice and removed the colored and white office signs in the office waiting rooms. As CDGM closed, he opened his own Head Start program in Jackson and performed the required physical examinations with the assistance of his wife and children and a few uh, UMC faculty members on weekends. I did it and I know what to do. Uh, in May of 1968, Hendrick and a group of other business and professional leaders published a full-page article titled Statement of Belief and Intention in the Clarion Ledger, calling for an end to racial strife and discrimination in Mississippi. When a Senate subcommittee came to Mississippi, and that committee included Robert Kennedy, to see for themselves uh, if uh, our senators claimed that there were no hungry children in Mississippi, Dr. Hendrick greeted Kennedy and his party among a jeering crowd at the Jackson Airport and took him to his house for a nap prior to conducting public hearings at the Heidelberg Hotel in Jackson. 
Hendrick's actions occurred at a time when his neighbor, Rabbi Nussbaum's house was bombed with dynamite by the KKK, and when he would not let his family members go out to pick up the morning paper alone for fear of violence against them. The next day, uh, 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 after uh, the welcoming at the Jackson Airport, the senators toured the Delta, where they quickly found malnutrition among adults and children, emaciated babies, and abysmal living conditions in blacks, all duly reported by Bill Miner, who is present on this photo on the far right, um, to the national media. So this group of senators, Republicans and Democrats, came to Mississippi and saw what was going on here and realized that the claims that there were no hungry folks in Mississippi were completely bogus. After that visit to the Delta and uh, publications of pictures uh, like this of what he saw, uh, uh, Kennedy returned to Washington and met with U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Orville Freeman and told him, you have got to get food to these people in starving Mississippi. He didn't. The scenario eventually resulted in the documentary, which is still online, if you haven't seen it, it's amazing, Hunger in America, that appeared on national TV uh, in May of 1968. Major changes followed in federal food programs and Head Start, and the National Health and Nutrition Survey, called NHANES, was implemented to mo monitor child health. This continues till today, and yes, we still have hungry children in Mississippi. Well, time for some good news, and the good news is we have made progress uh, in medicine in this state, and we are committed to continuing to do that. Um, this is the 2018 leadership class of the Mississippi Medical Association. Uh, but there are still two medical associations in Mississippi, and there's still distrust between them, but they're talking. We need more fearless leaders in our state who are intolerable of the status quo, men like Robert Smith and Jim Hendricks. The racial separation that persists inhibits our ability to demand an end to the policies of race that perpetuate health disparities. Now, how can this happen with all this baggage? Our book closes uh, with references to this book, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu's No Future Without Forgiveness. It, it provides the best model that we know uh, as how to resolve uh, communication issues, fear and distrust between blacks and whites. And his activities there prevented uh, a civil war in South Africa at the end of apartheid. The model requires hard work, listening to all sides, acknowledging the injuries of the past, and somehow forgiving, but not forgetting. That's the activity in which you participate today, and I thank you for that. Has a question. And Webster has a question. Microphone. Microphone. It was. Let's try it again. Not on, Dr. Rick. Hey. Hey. Uh, question, comment, really. You mentioned in Birmingham that African Americans did not go to white doctors. Well, that did not happen in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, my father was a doctor. He had a lot of African American patients. Uh, and he was a doctor in the day that you would make house calls. And I can remember going with him, you know, in the car to the African-American neighborhood. So that did not happen in, in, yeah, in the same regard as Yeah, that was the same thing in, in the Delta. As I mentioned, the planters there uh, contracted with the doctors who were there, black and white, to see their patients. And <clears throat> that particular 
interaction became a part of the politicization of health care in the Delta because when the, um, when the white citizens councils got involved, uh, if the black doctors were, who were, had these contracts to take care of field workers were members of the NAACP, uh, their, their contracts were dissolved or the, the bank loans were called in for the planners. So there were exceptions. Uh, I think Birmingham was one nut harder than Jackson, uh, but, uh, but there, there were not a lot of white physicians seeing uh, black patients. Um, thanks very much for that very informative and interesting talk. There's a lot to be learned and gained from that. Um, my question is slightly outside of your study. It has to do with um, the, since your background is from Alabama, I assume that you know about the Tuskegee, Tuskegee study in the 1930s when blacks were used as experiments for the syphilis um, um, problem. I wonder if you could say something about that because it's, it should have lasted just a year or two. Instead of that, it lasted 40 years. And could you explain to us why it lasted so long and what, um, how, how did blacks um, survive that kind of a, a, a terrible um, situation? So I should repeat the seven. question. The question is about uh, the Tuskegee study and how in the world could that have happened. That was a study where uh, a number of African Americans were enrolled in a study to look at what happened to untreated syphilis. And even though penicillin was available, uh, they never got it. And so the disease progressed and it was a way that they documented what happens when you don't treat syphilis. That was the tip of the iceberg. That whole story has not been told. Most of the medical research in the 50s and 60s was done on black prisoners in prisons, federal and state prisons, and uh, including most of the drug development. And they were, they were coerced into participation by getting privileges uh, and sometimes a little bit of money. Uh, White uh, prisoners were uh, not included in the more dangerous studies. So what you saw in Tuskegee was only part of a larger area of this whole thought process that blacks were inferior and less worth than whites. And if there was a problem with the drug or a side effect or a death, it didn't count as much. And the only way that you can explain the way that uh, one group treats another uh, in the way that we have treated blacks is to demean and devalue that person. And that's what we have done. Uh, and, you know, the word's out. There's no difference. Uh, we had a professor at the University of South Alabama where I served who did studies for years to show that black heads were smaller than whites because their brains were smaller, okay? And he published this work and it was totally erroneous. So that's our history and we need to own up to it. Uh, and that's why we can be as, we're as cruel as we were. I'd like to hear Dr. Robert Smith say a few words about his role in creating the federally qualified health centers both here and across the country. Dr. Smith never said a few words, <laughs> but I'm sure he'll say some words. Uh, well, so let me help focus this. The question is, how did you, no, go ahead and stand up. How did you, what role did you play in the establishment of community health centers, and what were they? First of all, let me thank uh, Judy and Rims, who are my bosses, 
for allowing me to be here today, and who are civil libertarians who believe that all men are created equal and who've given a life and career to that. And just had a board meeting yesterday and gave me permission uh, to be here. Uh, I also want to recognize the dean of the medical school here. He was one of the deans who brought, not brought you here, but doing your tenure as Arthur Guyton. Uh, as the University of Mississippi uh, begins to assume begins to assume its responsibility uh, in providing uh, health care for all Americans, and I want to thank you, number one, for adding to the literature. This is a tremendous add to the literature, and Gloria, uh, I feel sorry for you because uh, this is. This, I have been aware of black history all of my life, and uh, this is one of the most significant contributions that I have seen uh, as it relates to providing information and the role that black physicians played in helping to guarantee health care for all Americans. Uh, and that comes up to uh, 1965, as you brought out in the book. Uh, I had what Dr. and Mrs. Sanders used to call a taste. They went around giving a taste, and they had a taste at their house from Megar Evers uh, the night of June 12th, and when, and when they invited me and called me before day that morning to let me know that Megger had been assassinated and we went back for a morning party. And you have brought all of this out in the book. In 1895, black doctors formed a facsimile of the AMA because we couldn't get in as full members and became the sportsmen's for uh, health care for all Americans. One of the things I always said, the basis, and this was brought out in the 1953 decision of the United States Supreme Court, <laughs> the real problem in America is racism. <laughs> I believe that, believe in my heart, uh, that if the framers of the Constitution had understood health care as a right, that they would have made that as a right for all Americans. Uh, getting back to my role in founding healthcare centers and as a, as a doctor to the movement, uh, Jack Geiger, Cap Gibson, and five other great physicians who had volunteered their time, we all called a meeting to see what we could gain from all of that tremendous effort and volunteer effort of physicians and medical schools in the state uh, to reduce violence and to do other things doing Freedom Summer. And that was a very important effort here. But more than less, we met in Greenville in the, in the uh, Council of Churches office, a little small office. And I said to them at that time, we need a new institution, and that was documented. We scrambled through the night, told stories, and story after story. And Jack Geiger, at the end of the night, early in the morning said, we ought to name it a community health center. I saw something like that in South Africa in 1969. But nevertheless, we didn't know about funding or anything. And later on, we found out about uh, OEO, who had funded Head Start, uh, for which, as you brought out, I was the medical director for Head Start that prepared the, helped prepare the information for the Kennedy visit. And uh, we prepared this grant that include the social determinants of care and also uh, at Mount Bio because that represented a, a real focus of black health care for, for black Mississippians. We were basically excluded. One of the things that you have aptly brought out, uh, everything in this state was, was 
segregated at that time. Uh, the most, one of the best places for black getting health care in Mississippi was to go over to Jackson State uh, to a health center. Or I still occasionally see blacks with scars on their belly who travel up to Yazoo City uh, for surgery. Uh, uh, they're almost dead now. But the important thing is Jack Geiger, Count Gibson, and myself took that responsibility on, developed a proposal, and the first week of August of 1965, we dropped it in the Office of Economic Opportunity. Uh, the medical director is all, had also been a volunteer here. Um, I'm, I can't call his name. And another friend of Schreiber was Aaron Henry, and he went we tapped Aaron to go with us, the four of us, for calling for community health centers, one in Boston and one in Mount Bayou. And from that grew, uh, first called community health centers, now FQAC sees to serve 30 million Americans, 300,000 of them in Mississippi. It's really the only organized fashion of developing primary and secondary health care in the country uh, that's cost effective, uh, that uh, has a quality component. But in addition to that, since you want to talk about uh, the racial divide, uh, that racial divide of, of black physician had brought all of us closer to uh, guaranteeing all Americans health care in this country in a sense that 65 was also the year that Johnson uh, had tried, as all of you know here, we had tried a national health care program ever since the New Deal, Social Security, but it always failed. And thank God to the Civil Rights Movement and, and uh, Martin Luther King and the other five leaders said to Johnson, in addition to the right to sit on the lunch counter, you don't have the right to get health care and was able to force uh, health care, uh, Medicare and Medicaid. That same year, your dean, Marston, and I was also invited to Washington to institute regional medical programs, which brought about the advances of heart cancer, stroke, and later renal disease to the community. And we've already talked about uh, uh, the child health program. So, and during those times, more money is full. Back then we had only 90 medical schools. Now we have 133. Most, most medical schools have doubled their size. So it was on the backs of the other America, those poor black physicians who brought this to the country's attention that all of us now enjoy more medical care despite the fact that Mississippi uh, we are still 49th or 50th in every indices except for telehealth and, and immunizations. Uh, thanks to the young lady who's head of uh, the Mississippi Health Department has brought us to be number one in immunizations. So we still got a long way to go and it's gonna take everybody's effort here today and more uh, and your book to bring an awareness that all Americans have a right to good health care. Thank you so much. We're at the top of the hour. I think we passed the top of the hour. We passed the top of the hour. I love this series because you not only hear about the history, but you can hear from the folks who made the history. Thank you all for coming today. We have copies of this book for sale over here. Dr. Deshays will be glad to sign a copy, and I'll bet Dr. Smith will do so as well. That's it. I hope that we see you back here next Wednesday. Help me thank Dr. Deshays for this program today.